good afternoon, everyone. Hope uh, you are having a good time. So, a um, uh, couple of weeks back, uh, you know, we had our uh, US version or the North American version of this conference in San Francisco. Um, and during that conference, we uh, uh, talk about this new concept that Tyler explained, uh, the agility and the agile story. So, he gave his uh, great keynote. Uh, so whenever Tyler talking in the, uh, on the stage, I feel like this moonwalk, not the uh, Neil Armstrong's moonwalk, Michael Jackson moonwalk, because the way he used the stage and then how smooth he's giving uh, the talk. And then Paul and myself, we uh, helped him to uh, uh, kind of detailly explain about this uh, reference architecture and the reference methodology. Uh, so that's what happened uh, a couple of weeks before, and then after that, I took vacation. Uh, then and, uh, between these two conferences, nothing much happened. So I have to reuse some of the slides. Uh, fortunately, most of you were not there, so you will feel it as original, but few will feel it as a remake. But uh, in the uh, music industry, sometimes the remakes are better than original, so I don't think you will waste time. So, uh, Tyler explained and uh, positioned this uh, problem that we are trying to solve, uh, but I will kind of repeat it. Uh, so, he mentioned uh, there are more than 50% of the organizations following some kind of agile um, uh, process, but less than 40% benefiting, uh, full, getting the full benefit out of it. So, that's one thing. And then the second thing, uh, even these organizations believe that they are doing some kind of agile um, process. Uh, they are not really agile. We call it as fast waterfall. But uh, in the industry, people give different names. Some call it as agile, and then some call it as water scrum fall and agile fall, so and so forth. So why it's happening? Uh, basically, most of these enterprises uh, operate in a centralized manner, as well as they are using the technology uh, in a centralized manner, as well as there are a lot of layers, and layers creates gates, and it slows down the execution of uh, these uh, internal operations and efficiency of the people. Then the second thing is this uh, brownfield and greenfield. So brownfield, uh, basically organizations using a lot of legacy data, uh, legacy services, legacy systems, and Greenfield is the organization using the modern technologies like uh, containers, serverless, uh, uh, containers, microservices, serverless, so and so forth. And if you look at, uh, uh, in any organization, most of the organizations, the brownfield part is um, bigger than the greenfield. So we were looking for a solution that can address both uh, brownfield and greenfield. So this is Paul Fremantle, so our CTO and co-founder. Uh, he's my boss, but uh, uh, he's uh, more than a boss. He's a great uh, coach and a great mentor and a friend for me. So Paul, um, uh, he took a break in 2014 uh, to complete his PhD, and then 2018 he came back uh, by completing his PhD on a research uh, he did uh, based on IoT security. So with uh, the Paul's return, uh, Tyler introduced this new organization unit called the CTO's office. Uh, as a result, then I moved to the CTO's office, and the first thing that I did created the reference architecture for the CTO's office um, by uh, listening to uh, uh, Tyler, Paul, and Sanjeev, getting their expectations what we should um, uh, deliver. So the things that you see in your left-hand side, I'm responsible, and then uh, things in the right-hand side, uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Srinath Pereira, he is uh, uh, responsible and he's doing a presentation about those things tomorrow as well. So then this uh, reference architecture and the reference methodology became an official thing and a product that uh, CTO's office will create, manage, and then release frequently. Uh, so that's how this idea came uh, up. And uh, then uh, July 1st, actually, I did the move to the CTO's office, and then we were looking at how we can build this concept. So first thing that we did, uh, we did a lot of research, whatever the online content available, uh, published by different people, our uh, other vendors, uh, competitors, so and so forth. And then we did a lot of reading. Uh, even we read a lot of research papers done by academies, and then uh, uh, and we talked to our customers as well, who's kind of willing to share 
their information. So Paul is based in London. Uh, I live in San Francisco. So uh, we had like early morning calls, like 4 a.m. Um, and then I did a couple of visits to London. Paul came to San Francisco. We did a lot of uh, whiteboard sessions. So somehow uh, we got these two papers released on uh, July 16th. Um, so uh, the reference architecture is uh, point 0.9 version, and then reference methodology, we really really it as a point 0.5 version by keeping some room to improve. So it was, a, a uh, it, it was just a start, but I put a steady start based on the uh, feedback we got from the customers and the attendees who attend to our US conference. So a lot of customers, they gave positive feedback and a uh, bunch of them invited us to come and talk to their uh, executives as well as uh, help them to uh, implement these two um, uh, papers, basically. So. Uh, 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 when I was preparing for this conference, uh, actually US conference, my kids asked what am I going to do during this conference. Then I told them I'm going to read these two papers that I uh, was writing for a while. And then my daughter, she, she kind of rolled her eyes and said, boring. I hope it will not a boring thing for you. Actually, I'm planning to do walk you through these two papers in a very high level and then explain how you can use the content behind these two papers. So the, the talk is uh, two parts, reference architecture first and then reference methodology. Uh, so before I jump into the content in the paper, um, what is a reference architecture? So this is um, what I see uh, at home on daily basis, Legos. Uh, so uh, if you take Legos, Legos provide uh, some set of guidelines that you can use and then uh, connect these different components, come in a Lego set and build something. So reference architecture is like that. You can use those guidelines and build something exactly explained in the uh, architecture document. And if you are creative, you can build something more by utilizing the same set of components. So this is what uh, Wikipedia says. It's a template solution for architecture uh, that for a particular domain or a problem space, that is what uh, reference architecture means. So as I explained earlier, when we are doing the uh, research, we found a lot of reference architectures. Even you might be thinking why we need a new reference architecture. So why we need a new reference architecture? Because we found there's a mismatch. The reference architectures available are, uh, this is my personal opinion, are a kind of more reference implementations rather than reference architectures, because most of these uh, available content explain to um, have a solution by using a specific technology. So we thought of uh, it's not the way to do this. We need to come up with something, a technology neutral uh, way of addressing uh, this problem. And if you read the paper, we are not talking about any specific vendor or a technology. It's a completely technology neutral thing that we have written. That's one problem. And then the second problem, as I explained um, earlier, the solution should address the green field as well as brown field. And then the third thing is this, uh, uh, the existing stuff are not uh, helping much to be agile. And the last thing is those are not utilizing the latest technologies like containers, microservices, and um, uh, uh, serverless and so forth. So that's why we thought of uh, come up with this new architecture. So history, uh, and uh, I think most of you are, uh, you, you are working on different kind of architecture, um, uh, architectures as well as build different systems. So let's look at what are the architecture patterns that we were using for a while. And if you look at uh, in 70s, uh, this uh, gigantic uh, single layered architecture came that uh, we had the, U, uh, the user interfaces, business logic, and data in a single layer. And then with the enhancement of the databases, we divided into two layers, one called the data layer and uh, UI and the business logic uh, separated into a separate layer. Then in 90s, actually, in 90s, even I started my career, so uh, this three T architecture was very popular that you have the user interfaces and then the business logic and data in three layers. And then after that, with the, uh, uh, the rise of the web-based uh, development, this uh, sub-pattern of the 3T architecture called MVC, Model View Controller, came into the picture that introduced a new messaging layer that connects the uh, UI and the, um, uh, the business logic as well as the data. Then uh, in 2000, uh, uh, the service-oriented architecture came into the picture. It uh, wrapped the uh, business logic 
using services and APIs and exposed to uh, consume at the UI level. And uh, there are sub-patterns, like event-driven architecture, web-oriented architecture came as a result of that. And if you notice, all these architecture patterns are layered. Then uh, in 2012, I think 2013 timeframe, microservices came into the picture. The theory behind microservices uh, um, more towards a segmented architecture that I will explain uh, in detail in a different slide. Uh, so if you look at all these patterns that we can uh, uh, categorize them into these two um, categories, the layered and segmented architecture. So these were the uh, architecture patterns that we were using for a while. So this is the, uh, uh, the layered architecture diagram that we, uh, WSO2, used for a while. Um, and I think we were a little bit ahead with the market at that time because uh, our architecture, we had, it, it's a two-dimensional architecture that we created. We used the, uh, the basic concept that uh, we are, uh, everybody was using to build a layered architecture called system of systems that you identify different kind of um, architecture layers and then put them as a stack. Uh, the difference we had in this diagram, uh, we um, considered about the runtime behavior and the quality of services and put it as a different uh, layer in this diagram. And we use this uh, uh, a lot and then we build a lot of uh, systems using uh, this particular architecture and had very productive discussions with uh, many architects as well. So uh, we were using this and then uh, we had a very bad experience with one of the customers that um, because of the waterfall method that they followed, the project got failed. And then Sanjeev uh, told me uh, it's enough eating this uh, uh, layered cake, uh, come up with something else. Actually those days, uh, if you walk to many bakeries, you will find only layered cakes because uh, we didn't have these uh, modern uh, uh, bakery houses like Baked by Bella. I think most of uh, the local people know about uh, Baked by Bella for the, uh, uh, the, our visitors. It's an urban uh, bakery shop that we have. I don't know about the quality of the food, but they have a very uh, powerful way of marketing the products. And if you follow their social media, you will find out what's the strategy behind that. So uh, yeah, so actually Sanji was talking about the layered architecture, not about the, uh, the cake. So we looked at uh, how to fix this problem uh, to come up with different kind of um, uh, layered architecture, but we ended up uh, uh, having layers in a different way. It was not successful. Same time, uh, microservices came into the picture and um, uh, the microservices, as I explained earlier um, in my slide, the concept and the theory behind microservices, it's about the segmentation, not about the layered architecture. But people who were uh, promoting microservices as well as build large enterprise systems using microservices, they ended up with um, layered architectures as well. So the Netflix, they uh, introduced the microservices and then they put an API layer on top of that and then it became layered. Uh, Uber, they uh, had the same concept but they named the API layer called the Edge Gateway, again a shared uh, services layer that uh, became a, layer, a layered architecture. eBay introduced the API facade that uh, they uh, put an API layer and then microservices to uh, do uh, service composition so and so forth. Interestingly, uh, Gartner uh, introduced this new concept called a mini services layer that you have the microservices, mini services, and then APIs, mini services uh, acting as a uh, composite or service composition layer. So uh, even microservices uh, uh, moving towards this layered architecture. So uh, we looked at the enterprise and then uh, drew this diagram. Even if you notice, the microservices and integration microservices, they are in a layer, and top of that you get the quality of services and uh, APIs and end-use applications. So um, then uh, I uh, usually submit a lot of uh, CFPs to different kind of external events. And I was lucky, one of the papers that I submitted uh, on uh, the subject of iterative architecture got accepted to this O'Reilly um, architecture, con architecture conference in London. And while I'm working on the slides, um, I looked at it in detail and then thought, okay, this layered architecture is not helping enough to be iterative, so what can we do? 
Um, so what I did looked at what our customers doing. So different uh, type of architectures that they are using, and uh, I picked few uh, customers who's utilizing microservices. Then I identified they have done something beyond the layered architecture. So they have the layers, but within the layers, there's a segmentation of the runtimes. So segmentation done uh, basically using two things. One is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the organization boundaries or the ownership, and the second thing based on the functionality. So it's a lot better than the earlier one uh, because you have more flexibility in the segmented architecture. Then, the, uh, then we had this discussion in February, like what kind of uh, reference architecture we should come up with. Then uh, the, um, uh, the segmentation concept came uh, from my side, and then Paul had a similar thought on how to do a modular architecture. Then we looked at this uh, biology uh, concept, then system biology concepts, then quantum computing concepts, and uh, the, some of the really cool concepts introduced by Kubernetes, one of the uh, great uh, uh, container orchestration framework. So we consider all these things and then um, came up with this cell concept. So uh, cell was a cool thing because if you look at uh, all this biological stuff built uh, on top of cells, and it provides the, uh, uh, the basic concept that we were looking at. The biggest challenge we had uh, was to convince Tyler on the term cell, and uh, we tried a couple of times, it failed, and then one day around 4.30, Paul um, uh, uh, talked to me and said, okay, it looks like Tyler is convinced, uh, we can go ahead with the term cell, so we uh, named it as cell-based architecture um, after that. So uh, the cell uh, architecture, Tyler briefly explained, um, but uh, if we dig in deep, um, the uh, atomic unit of the cell architecture called a component. So component can be a microservice, component can be a function, uh, component can be a legacy database, um, uh, uh, different um, a gateway, so and so forth. So anything that you run in a container-based environment or a hypervisor-based virtualized environment or a bare metal environment can treat as a component. So the collection of components create this cell and um, it's basically the um, uh, create a, a boundary and you can have any n number of components inside this cell. So the combination of the cell and components, in most cases, it's one to many, that one cell will have a number of services or microservices, but uh, you can have one cell and one component uh, as well, uh, based on how you design your service or your microservice. Then uh, the how these cells are connected and communicated, so each and every cell um, got a cell gateway, so it can be an API gateway, or it can be a traditional ESB, or um, it can be a message broker, or some kind of a gateway that can communicate with each other. And then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the cell gateway uh, will be doing the ingress and egress uh, both communication. The second uh, thing that how uh, the components inside communicating with each other and how the components um, uh, calling something outside the cell. Uh, so it's still like we are in the process of finalizing because uh, the, uh, the architecturally uh, uh, nice way is to go through the same gateway. But um, uh, my concern is uh, whether we can afford the latency added by that as well as uh, there are three other communication patterns introduced by the containers and microservices called the sidecar, adapt, and the ambassador. So whether we can have a proper implementation by going through the cell, but before we finalize the uh, version 1.0 of the, uh, uh, this architecture, we will finalize it. For the current, uh, at the moment, it's basically the incoming traffic will always come through uh, the cell gateway. That's the only way you can call the uh, inside components, but uh, uh, you can do a outside call uh, in, from a service to another gateway in another cell. So that's how the communication done uh, in this uh, uh, current version. And if you look at the enterprise, this is a high level view, you will see a lot of cells uh, operate. And um, two, uh, the, the, uh, the basic uh, 
two major types, uh, one called the internal cells and uh, one called the external cells. Again, the organization boundary or the ownership um, based on that, we decide whether it's an internal cell. If the organization owns the, those cells, we call them as internal cells. And if you are calling a, a remote uh, or an external SaaS application or a partner application, we treat it as an external cell. Internal cells, we categorize into three categories. One is a legacy cell, that if you have a legacy database or a legacy system, that you put a, a gateway on front of it and make it a legacy cell. And then the modern um, uh, cells that use the modern technologies, we call them, a, them as cloud native cells, that your microservices, uh, uh, functions and so forth will run inside the cloud native cells. Then on top of that, uh, you have all the uh, end use applications. So we call them as the end use application cells as well. So those are the type of cells that we um, will see in a uh, typical organization. Then this is a reference implementation. I'm not sure the fonts are big enough for you to read. So this is a sample um, implementation done based on the, uh, uh, the cell-based architecture that an order management system that uh, you will have, uh, you can see a customer cell that's calling an external um, CRM and then an order cell that's calling uh, order management system and uh, employee cell connect with the uh, user store and uh, HR system. And top of that, you get uh, all these end use applications. And if you carefully notice, some of the cells exposing the functionality as an API, some of them are exposing uh, the functionality as an event, and some as a stream. So you can use all these uh, three uh, uh, ways uh, to have uh, real time, near real time and uh, request response kind of uh, uh, patterns to use. So uh, I briefly mentioned about the intercell communication and intracell communication. This is how it will work. Uh, so uh, there is a data plane inside the cell that it can use local data. And there's a control plane inside the cell that it uh, will provide all the necessary uh, metadata and the functionality for the quality of services. And there's a common data plane outside uh, the cells that uh, used to um, share the data. And then there's a, a control plane outside uh, all the cells that act as a common uh, control plane to provide the quality of services uh, for uh, this uh, architecture. So we are using this gateway pattern uh, in uh, this uh, architecture heavily and it's not a new thing even if you go to a castle that you will see there are a few gateways uh, outside to control the traffic so that way they can manage who's coming in, who's coming out, what time they came, so and so forth. So we are using the same pattern. Uh, so that provides us uh, to enforce the governance and security as well. Uh, so uh, the cell gateway act as a policy, in, in, uh, policy uh, uh, enablement point, Pep, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then the, um, uh, uh, the policies uh, will store in a registry, uh, that's the policy store, and then the gateway can push the information required for observability uh, because it's uh, um, the same point that all the traffic will uh, go through, so that's how it helps for the governance. Then the, uh, the security of the cells, uh, cell can uh, be self-operate uh, within the information it has inside the cell or it can get help from the outside to fulfill the uh, security request. So two patterns, that uh, these are the basic patterns that you can have many complex uh, patterns as well. So if you noticed um, the first one, there's a security token service that provide all the metadata required to make authorization, authentication, or entitlement decision. But in the second uh, pattern, the security token service will go to the external uh, IDP and then get additional metadata to make the decision. So both patterns can use uh, based on what you require. Then the life cycle and version uh, of the cells is very important. So the cell will uh, contain its own version and the components inside the cell that I didn't put uh, because then the diagram will get too complicated. So the, each and every component will maintain its own version as well. And if you noticed, um, based on the, the development stage, it can have many number of environments. Like now if you look at this uh, cell, uh, the um, uh, 
uh, cell 105, uh, it got the development, test, uh, staging, and production. Uh, but uh, cell uh, 2, it's more mature, and then it uh, has two versions. The first version only got the production and staging environment, but uh, the 3.0 version still uh, some kind of development happening, so it got this uh, production, testing, and development um, uh, phases as well. And if you are using a container-based system, you don't need to run these uh, environments uh, all the, always, that whenever you require it, you can spin up it and then use it, so that's how the life cycle and version control works. So this helps uh, you to have this uh, blue-green um, kind of uh, deployments or rainbow deployments, even uh, canary uh, deployments that we used in modern uh, deployments uh, to help um, rapid application development and then continuous delivery, so and so forth. Then this is a reference implementation. So the, this diagram, it's not in the uh, paper because we made it uh, very uh, technology neutral. But if you look at, uh, I use a lot of WSO2 components like Ballerina, uh, Enterprise Service Bus, uh, Stream Processor, Identity Server. And uh, if you carefully look at it, there are other uh, technologies like Spring Boot, Nginx, um, and then different kind of UI technologies. Uh, so the uh, idea here, you can do a mix and match, like you, you might have different uh, development teams using different technologies, so they can uh, use them, uh, like uh, reuse them, uh, but uh, you can uh, use WSO2 components as well and then improve the architecture. So in a summary, uh, this is what the cell-based architecture provides you. Uh, uh, it's self-contained and then um, uh, you can like independently deploy it and then independently um, uh, scale it and um, uh, there's a local control plane and a local data plane and there's a cell gateway to communicate so that's uh, the summary of uh, the architecture pattern. So the second uh, part uh, of the presentation about the reference methodology uh, so the, I'll start uh, with that. So the definition of a methodology that uh, people, processes, and technology connects and um, uh, create an outcome. So uh, based on the efficiency of these uh, people, process, and technology, the outcome will uh, the vary. And actually this is a programmable Lego that uh, you can program and uh, uh, build certain stuff. So the last project actually I did with my son uh, to create uh, uh, a programmable ro a robot to uh, resolve a Rubik cube that it has a, a color sensor. First it scanned the Rubik cube and then uh, get the algorithm and then it fixed the Rubik cube. Very cool thing, it's called EV3. I think something you can try it out as well. So then this is the Wikipedia definition of what is a methodology. It's basically, uh, it says, um, a systematic theoretical analysis to uh, apply in, uh, based on the field or your interest and then get an outcome. So the people, process, and technology, like if you take, um, if you look at any methodology document, explain those three things. So what we did, we took a step ahead. I'll explain it in the next slide. Uh, so the, this, this is basically um, uh, the different type of uh, methodologies that we used in software development. Um, again, many um, methodologies, like one called the waterfall, and then we moved to spiral, then we, we started using Scrum, uh, then uh, rational unified process, extreme programming, so and so forth, and uh, later stuff called safe agile framework. But uh, uh, for me, we can categorize them into these two. One is more waterfall oriented and then one is more agile and then some in the mix of it. Uh, so that's what uh, we were using for a while. So then uh, you might be thinking again why we need a new reference methodology. Again, uh, the problem is uh, even if you are agile, if you don't have a proper environment, you can't be agile, that's the first thing. And then as Tyler mentioned, these layers create gates and then it uh, affect the efficiency of the movement or the operation of the people. So that's why we thought we need a new methodology. So as I explained earlier, most of the methodologies addressing this people, process, and technology, we thought we need more. Uh, so um, we identified the culture and the architecture create a platform for people and process to operate. And as a result, you get the digital alignment. 
So digital alignment is um, really important for the organizations. Um, uh, I think Jehan explained it and then kind of uh, uh, um, explained how important the digital alignment for an organization, how you can achieve it. So even we were in the same page that uh, all these improvements will uh, affect the digital alignment of the organization. So with that, uh, we came up with this uh, maturity model. So what we did, uh, look at our customers as well as the industry and then uh, try to identify uh, and position them in these different boxes. So the uh, uh, digital alignment, technology, people, process we used in one angle, and then the different kind of stages that monolithic, uh, fast waterfall, API driven, um, uh, then early agility and uh, integration agile, those are the stages that uh, we looked at. So the um, idea here, organization should move to the right uh, as much as possible, but uh, if you do assessment, uh, one organization might not fit in, in one column, that you might be better in one, uh, in some cases, and then you might have to improve a lot. Uh, so if you see, if you like look at this diagram, the organization one, um, it's, um, uh, uh, it's better in some of the processes and then some stuff it has to important, uh, improve. Uh, so the whole idea here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, moving to the right in this uh, maturity model. Then the, uh, the, now you have the maturity model, then you need to uh, find a way to um, uh, apply these things. So we call it as an iterative business transformation model because you can do the improvements, but you need to run the business as well. So this iterative model, basically you plan, you implement, um, then you get the feedback and then repeat that. So that's the model we are explaining in this document. Then the uh, move to the right, so the, uh, uh, you have the monolith, I didn't put it here. Uh, the second phase of this um, uh, maturity model is the fast waterfall. So that's basically, um, you get the basic integration of your organization. Uh, introduce an ESB or a message broker and then get your internal systems and external systems integrated. So that's where the fast waterfall um, uh, stage. And the second stage, um, you will have some agile teams and then uh, you put an API layer on top of your services layer and expose the um, APIs and let the APIs is the, uh, the mechanism to uh, share data and services. That's the uh, API driven uh, stage. Then we go to the uh, early agile stage. Some of part of the organization uh, work on the agile mode but uh, part of the organization is not uh, working on Agile and then this layered architecture and the gates um, uh, block the agility of uh, this organization. So those are the uh, three stages. Then the integration Agile is the, uh, uh, the most right um, version, uh, sorry, stage of this model that we are, we are uh, each and every organization want to be. So we uh, explain um, bunch of best practices how uh, an organization can be uh, integration agile. The first thing is people because um, we have to use people as a competitive advantage. Uh, so how uh, we can use it in this model? The first thing is called the agile core. Uh, basically uh, what it means, you create a small team, identify the people um, who got the correct skill set and then uh, easy to change and then in the mindset to change and build this agile core. And then uh, use the, um, uh, this uh, uh, model called uh, train the trainer, use the agile core and then train the other teams and make the entire organization a uh, agile workforce. So that is the first um, thing that uh, we recommended in the paper. The, the second bullet point is uh, one of the most, um, uh, I mean, important thing, uh, creating these self-organized teams. Basically, uh, you have small teams, but they are self-organized. They can plan, they can build, uh, they, uh, they will run their applications, and they will manage the application, they will support the applications as well as uh, they will repeat it and improve in a iterative manner. So that's called self-organization teams. And there's a concept called a podular architecture that you create these small pods and then make uh, an environment for these uh, self-organized teams to run um, uh, in uh, 
uh, uh, an organization. There's a book called Connected Company written by uh, this guy called Dave Gray. Uh, so it uh, clearly explained how you can build a uh, self-organized team. I highly recommend uh, for you to read that as well. Then the last one, in, uh, if, you are, if you have practiced Scrum or any other agile methodology, there's a Scrum master that who take the decisions, who runs everything, and then based on the scrum, scrum master's schedule that you will have the stand-up meetings so and so forth. But in this process, what we are uh, proposing, everyone is a agile master. And uh, based on the state of the uh, stage of the project, uh, people will take uh, the leadership, like at the initial stage, an architect might take the leadership, and development stage, a lead developer might take a, uh, a lead, and then when it goes to the uh, deployment stage, a DevOps person will take the lead, and a test engineer, so and so forth. So uh, we treat everyone as agile master in this process. Then the uh, process-wise, uh, it has to be iterative thing that I repeated it many times. So the approach should be iterate, iterative that you plan, build, uh, uh, release, improve, uh, get the feedback and improve um, in the uh, first, in the, in, throughout the process. Then the second thing is the continuous uh, nature of this thing, that how you can optimize the DevOps principles and then Agile principles, and then have a continuous integration, continuous testing, uh, and continuous delivery. Uh, because uh, the nature of this uh, uh, thing that uh, you have to frequently release, I think even Jehan mentioned that thing, we had to quickly release something and go to market. So do that. to do that, we need to have a proper uh, automated and a continuous integration process. Then the third point is uh, code over config. I think uh, even as a technology company, we were uh, promoting config over code for a while. But um, to be truly agile, you have to um, uh, do the other way around that you have to uh, use coding. Uh, one thing developers like to code, even in a configuration environment, if there's a way to plug a code, developer always write a um, uh, set of code and then plug it there. As well as uh, the code provides you more flexibility and then the support to uh, plug into the continuous integration, continuous testing systems. That's where even we as a technology company introduce Ballerina. You can use uh, Ballerina um, as a way to implement and then uh, use code over config as well. Then the last point is integration first. Uh, even Tyler mentioned uh, this thing briefly. Uh, why we have to uh, give integration first? Because uh, during last two decades, we used different kind of distributed computing technologies and then build a lot of smart endpoints. So a developer today, actually what they are doing, uh, basically integrating things and then creating new functionalities. So um, um, then we call uh, uh, today developer is integration engineer because that's what they are doing. Uh, so when you are uh, looking at the process, you have to give more um, uh, prominent for the integration and identify uh, the correct architecture and then correct way of communicating um, by giving uh, priority for integration. Then the technology-wise, um, uh, if you are a developer, uh, it takes a lot of time to start a project that you create to create the sandbox, connect with the um, version control system, and then connect with the continuous integration system, it's a pain. Like uh, in my experience, uh, sometimes it took around an entire weekend to set up the development, and envir in development environment, and it reduced the productivity of the developers. So that's where we call your um, system should be pipeline tuned. That means within couple of, uh, by running couple of scripts, a developer should be able to uh, create the sandbox environment and then uh, uh, connect it with the uh, version controlling system and then connect with the um, uh, continuous integration system. Now, Ballerina, uh, we have some basic stuff like when you do a Ballerina in it, it creates a, a project structure so and so forth, but we are in the process of introducing rest of the stuff uh, into the, uh, uh, that language as well. Then the, uh, the multi-environment based application life cycles, uh, because I briefly mentioned about uh, the blue-green deployments and uh, the uh, rainbow deployments. Uh, at least you should have two environments, otherwise uh, you can't do this uh, rapid deployments because uh, uh, once you change something, you should be able to test it in a different uh, parallel environment. 
Then festival development, uh, nothing to mention, you know the uh, advantage of it. Uh, the traditional way of doing uh, development, you write the code and then you write the test cases, but what we are explaining here, write your test and then generate the test data as well, because that's a common problem a lot of organization, organizations are facing because they can't test the application that they don't have enough test data. So generating test uh, cases as well as test um, data, uh, you had to do it uh, at the early stage. Then uh, utilize the cloud native technologies like containers, uh, so and so forth, and then optimize uh, your environments uh, because then you can utilize them a lot uh, on your benefit. And then the open source uh, playing a bigger role here as well that you don't need to wait uh, and go through a procurement process to access open source uh, technology. You can just go to the website, download it, and then use it and uh, build your uh, systems without waiting. So open source uh, playing a bigger role here. And the last point is um, connecting the reference architecture and the methodology. So by utilizing the cell-based architecture, you can have a proper modular system and then apply more and more agility into your methodology. So that's where you can utilize the cell-based architecture. Then the uh, digital alignment. Um, so uh, uh, even Jayan mentioned about the value of the end users and how uh, to treat them. So you have to uh, have a consumer driven requirement process. Because um, in most of the development, what we are doing bottom up approach, that we uh, design a data set, uh, write some set of services, expose it as an API, and then write application. Rather than doing that, you should understand the consumer and then uh, uh, design the application first and then look at what are the APIs I require to build the application. Uh, those might exist or you might have to create the new APIs. And then look at how we are going to fetch the data. So that's a, a consumer driven uh, requirement thing that you start from the top and then go down in this path. Then the uh, next um, uh, recommendation start with the MVP. MVP stand for a minimum viable product that you understand your consumer and then provide a MVP and then quickly go to market. So that's a good way to beat the competition. Then the uh, digital native applications. So uh, today uh, your consumers, they are looking for a digital native application that um, they are looking for a personalized uh, experience and they are looking for a real time experience and they are looking for a geosensitive experience based on your location, uh, give a different experience as well as they are looking for a predictive information by using um, like uh, machine learning or AI kind of technologies. And then the last thing is uh, the enforcing the feedback loops. Now you have to have enough, enough feedback loops to get the consumer behavior and how the system operates, uh, what kind of transaction that they operate, how they are uh, patterns of buying and then patterns of uh, using these applications. So once you have the feedback loops, you can uh, use that as a um, uh, way to improve your application and then iteratively improve your applications and deliver them. So uh, in summary, if you look at the integration agile environment, it will look like this. It's a modular architecture that uh, small teams operate and then the distance with the consumer and the, uh, uh, the development is very low, that they get quick feedback and utilizing cloud native environments, uh, then using the cell-based architecture and uh, everything is continuously integrated and each uh, team plan, build, test, run, and manage. And uh, this uh, transform from the current state to that, you can utilize the reference architecture and uh, reference methodology as a, a tool. So uh, these theory in these papers, how you can make it uh, to practice. So I use this analogy of uh, GPS uh, uh, for this. Now, um, um, GPS provide uh, guidance for you to uh, go from one destination to other. Uh, so same thing you can do here, use the uh, maturity model, do an assessment and then understand where you are. And then uh, use the maturity model and decide what's the uh, destination that you want to go. And use the uh, reference architecture and the reference methodology as a way to uh, uh, guide you to achieve that particular destination. But um, uh, if you are using a GPS tracker and going in a journey, you have to uh, consider the road conditions, 
That's basically the environment that you operate. And then you have to consider the, uh, uh, the condition of the vehicle. That's the technology that you are using. And uh, you have to pay attention to the, uh, uh, the vehicles going parallel to you. That's your competition. You have to keep an eye on that. And uh, if you see something interest or if you uh, see some place, interesting place, you can take a detour, uh, but uh, the GPS will uh, put you back on track. That's what the reference architecture and the methodology is doing. And then you have to consider the people inside the vehicle as well, uh, because uh, based on how they operate, your uh, journey will change. Uh, so that's the people and the culture. And then you need a, a good driver who will drive this journey. Uh, if you have a driver like Tyler, Jehan, or Sanjeeva, you are lucky that uh, they will take the correct decision and then take you from that uh, 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 the, the, the current destination, the current uh, place to the destination that you required. So I would like to leave with this quote. Uh, the transformation is a journey without a destination because um, um, it, do it doesn't have a defined destination from the where you are, you have to move to the right. And as an uh, organization, we are happy to help you with this thing. So we are happy to do an assessment for you and then we are happy to um, identify it and then uh, customize the uh, methodology for you and then uh, define a, a correct plan and then we are happy to um, work with you and build um, different architectures based on your requirements as so and so forth. So that's how we can engage and then be a partner with you and then help in this journey. So last but not least, um, I am in the process of converting these two PDF documents to Markdown. I'm sure you know about Markdown. It's a great platform to do documentation. And uh, convert them into Markdown and then put it into the Git repo. So that way, uh, these two documents will become a community-driven document. Uh, so you can even contribute after that. You can send a pull request or create an issue and uh, uh, bring your ideas into the reference architecture and the methodology. That's something that I'm planning to uh, finish soon. Uh, so I'm expecting a lot of uh, pull requests from you based on your experience as well as uh, ideas that you have. Uh, so that's all I have, and I think it was, it was helpful. Um, thank you.